Ever thought of making lots of money by selling 3D print models? Well, in this video, I'm going to give you a detailed breakdown of the steps I took to make this 3D model of One Punch Man, showing you how you can go about making 3D models for print. You can get the STL file so you can print it out yourself for free, links in the description. I've tried to make this as beginner friendly as possible, so there's lots a beginner can learn, but it's more for intermediate to advanced level users. I have split it into chapters so you can jump to the different areas, and it's not all time lapse, there's lots of slowed down parts where I go through in detail of certain techniques. There's still a lot for me to learn about the 3D printing side of things in terms of the right settings for 3D printers, but there's lots of detail here to model for 3D print specifically. If you want to learn more about modeling characters, then do check out the links in the description and my website for more great content. Also, this video is sponsored by PC Specialist and NVIDIA. So the first thing I did was I downloaded a base mesh from Sketchfab. This one's from Miles0707. It's nice and simple. It's not really the proportions that I want, but I can change all that. But it certainly saves me about an hour's worth of work just blocking out a base mesh, which is completely unnecessary. And it's very common practice for people to use a base mesh like this. It saves you an awful lot of time. Now this character does come with a rig and you might be tempted to put them into a pose. However, that would be a mistake because you would lose the ability to sculpt with symmetry. We pose the character much later on in the process. So I can delete the rig, select my character, go into sculpt mode. And from here, I've got my remesh options up the side here. The voxel size is all important because that's the faces. You can see that amount by pressing shift R and then you can find a good amount for your model. In this case, we're doing kind of the second level of detail because we already have the base mesh. So going down to something like 0.005 in this case makes a lot of sense. Then I can either come up to the remesh and press remesh here or control R is the shortcut. Now I'm ready to adapt the main proportions. For 3D printing, you don't want fingers, so I made sure the hands were into a fist, which obviously makes sense for One Punch Man anyway. Fingers are often far too small and thin and they'll snap off if you try and print them. You can just smooth the hands out, turn them into a blob and then remesh again, and then you can sculpt them into a fist later on. And the first stages are just simple sort of reshaping of the main features to make sure I've got the right proportions of One Punch Man. He's kind of short and thin-ish. And at this stage, I'm not really adding any detail. I'm just getting the main proportions. Now there's often a bit of a trick when it comes to sculpting characters. What parts do you actually sculpt and what parts can you model? And the boots was a good example of this. I tried sculpting them and I was getting nowhere. It does kind of make it much easier if you have everything as one model, you don't need to jump between one and the other. But for something that's so structural like a boot, it's much easier to actually use traditional box modeling because of the hard surface qualities of something like a boot, especially the sole. So I'm using a cylinder and I'm kind of wrapping it around my model. I'm not actually using anything like the shrink wrap modifier. I'm just using my base mesh as a guide for the outline of the boot and then just moving it into position using a fair bit of proportional editing. And I try and keep it to quads, so I do kind of sort out the geometry slightly. It's much better with quads using the multi-resolution modifier, which I use for the detailed sculpt of these kind of objects. It's particularly around the sole of the shoe where it's much easier with box modeling techniques like this. The next step, once I've got those proportions and I'm happy with the overall shape, is to start a slightly more detailed sculpt. The tricky bit for adding detail though is how far do you need to go for a 3D print? And in many ways, this was an experimentation for me, so I was kind of finding out as I went along. Of course, that does depend to some degree on how big you're going to print out your model, whether it's going to be a miniature or closer to 20 or 30 centimeters. And if you look at the shots of the final model, you can see the kind of detail level that you're actually able to achieve at different sizes. So you're not getting a huge amount of detail, but you are kind of getting those stylized details, like you can kind of make out the fingers and the bigger stylized creases. When modeling the hands, I find it much easier to do the fingers first and then just add in a thumb later. So for the fingers, I just use the draw sharp and the crease brush to kind of draw in the four fingers. Then for the thumb, I start off with a cube and just box model it to create a sort of finger shape with the subdivision surface modifier. Once I've completed it and I'm happy with the position, I can then join it to the mesh and remesh once again. And once I've got that main outline, I can start adapting it and adding a little bit of detail. For the very top part of the glove where it creases and joins with the arm, I use the reverse draw sharp brush to kind of pull it out and the clay strips to fill it in and make it kind of bulk out away from the main shape. You can see me do a similar thing for the top of the clothing here. I just use the clay strips for this bit, but later on I go in with the reverse draw sharp brush to pull out the edge and kind of separate it. 
So for the face and the head, I probably did a bit more detail than was necessary, but I wasn't completely sure at this point as to how much detail I would actually need or be able to print. I kept it stylized with sharp edges, and this is kind of Saitama whilst he's going into beast mode, not the funny rounded face which we often see in the more comical parts of the anime. After working on this for a bit, I realized that the proportions were a fair bit out and I decided I needed to scale up the head. So I did a mask of the head and then had to move the pivot point in order to scale it, as you can see me doing here. I rarely go into orthographic view, but I felt I needed to just to make sure I got the proportions right and the eyes in the right place. He had a ginormous cranium at one point, so I needed to sort that out. For the belt, I ended up doing a really silly method, which I should have done completely differently, but it's an interesting method you might want to see. You mask out a certain area, then you can go into the mask options and mask extract and press OK. Then you've got a completely new mesh that you can shape and edit. The reason that I think this was pointless is because I ended up remeshing it eventually and the time it took for me to kind of smooth it out and sort the edges out, I should have just done a cylinder around the middle and shrink wrapped it. It would have been much easier. For the belt buckle, that's fairly straightforward. I just used a cylinder for the middle bit and then mirrored the sort of extra bits on the edges. So at this point, I want to remesh the model so I can use a multi-resolution modifier to add more detail. It's much more powerful than a simple remesh because you can go to a much higher sculpting level in terms of the amount of faces, but you can also pose your model. So I put the quad count fairly high at 30,000 and of course selected Saitama and pressed the remesh button. The quad remesh is fantastic, it makes the process so simple. It's one of the few add-ons I think is really worth the money. If you're doing lots of character sculpts, particularly for 3D printing, it's a must-have. Okay, so that's finished and it's hidden my original male low poly and I've got my retopo here. You can see the quality of the retopo. Obviously, I've lost a lot of the detail in my sculpt around the face, around the ears. So somehow I've got to get the detail from the high poly sculpt, which is here, and I'll quickly rename that and put it onto my low poly. So first of all, I take my low poly and I add a multi-resolution modifier to it. So down to the modifiers, add modifier, multi-resolution. I can subdivide that a couple of times and I'm up to around 3 million faces. That's all I need for a 3D print sculpt, but you can go to 50 or 60 million. The problem is I still haven't got the detail in things like the ears. If I hide the high poly, you can see it's just a bit blobby. So I need to use a shrink wrap modifier for my retopo. So add modifier, shrink wrap. And let's scroll down to that. The target is the male high poly. And you can see almost instantly I get a fair bit of my detail back. Initially, the wrap method is set to nearest surface point. It does a reasonably good job, but it can be slightly better with project. Looks strange to start off with, but if we make sure the negative and the positive are ticked, we get a slightly better shrink wrap. So there's nearest surface point and there's project. And it's very slightly cleaner. I can subdivide this once more and at that point I can now apply the shrink wrap modifier and I can continue sculpting with the multi-resolution modifier as well as setting this into a nice pose. So now I do just that, I get in an armature just from the Rigify add-on and paste that in. Uh, keep it really basic, I don't do any of the IK and things like that, it's just so I can pose the model, that's all. I still keep all the objects separate so they're all parented to the mesh separately and just move the armature and pose it into a nice position. The great thing is I can turn the armature off and keep sculpting on the original without the armature applied, which means I've got all the functionality of using the mirror, which you can see me doing here. First, I add a bit more detail to the belt buckle in terms of resolution, and then I'll add a multi-resolution modifier to sculpt some detail on top of that. You can see the remesh of the belt I did there, and I've figured that the belt was a bit too wide, so shorten that. It's sometimes things like that you don't really notice, even though you've got all these reference images, you just sort of make a belt and then forget to even look at the references and then suddenly you look up and it's completely the wrong shape. Now I go quite overboard with some of the details here, adding sort of minute creases and things like that. These didn't come out in the final print, but I'm kind of happy they're there because it makes for a good thumbnail. And I'm leaving them into this video because you might want to see how I go about doing them and the kind of detail that's on the model and what comes out with a 3D print so you can kind of compare and see what's worth it. I sharpen up all the features of the shape because obviously the multi-resolution modifier loses that little bit of detail. Again, it's possibly not worth it in terms of what comes out with the print, but in the end, it's nice to have that detail, especially when I decimate the model right at the very end. That's a modifier that reduces all the polygons by kind of triangulating it. It keeps all the detail though, so that makes it really good. 
and it's helpful to have a very detailed mesh to start with before the decimation process. Some of the bigger creases come out, so those sort of stylized creases on the boot there, but the seams that I'm drawing in here, you don't really notice. Also, I've added a multi-resolution modifier to the boots as well, that's why I'm able to sculpt on them. And it's nice because I can go in and edit the shape really easily if I need to. Do the same for the belt as well. Now at this point, I want to make sure everything's right in the pose, so I turn off symmetry when sculpting and sort out things like the arm, because when the model's posed, there's pinching of the mesh, so the shape is overlapping itself, and that won't work with 3D printing. To start with, I get the mesh as close as I can to finished, and will eventually apply all the modifiers and things like that, and do a final sculpt on top of that, making sure that nothing's overlapping. So now we have an object with lots of separate pieces, but we can't send it to the 3D printer like that. You can, I believe, send it to programs like Mesh Mixer, which will join objects together, but we can do it in Blender as well. The problem we have is that we do have multi-resolution modifiers on our objects. So at this point, we do need to apply those modifiers if we are to join objects together. So we can select everything, right click, convert to mesh, and that will apply all our modifiers. So if I select the boots, you can see there's no modifiers on any of these objects. The other reason we need to do this, if I zoom in on the arm, there's a lot of overlap in here and pinching where we have posed the model. And 3D printers don't like overlap, so we'll need to sort that out. So first of all, we'll join all the objects together. So I can select all my objects, and I'm making sure my male remesh, the main base of my model, is the active object. I can then press Control J and join them all together. So they're all joined, but we do need to do a remesh at this point in order to stop any overlap where the objects meet. So we go into the sculpting workspace, and once again, we use our remesh tools. Within the remesh, I can actually check the voxel size. So use my pipette here and pick an area on the highest resolution, on the highest poly part of my object. And if I go back to my remesh, it's set to 0.009, and then I can remesh. Now you don't have to remesh at a really high quality because lots of the detail will be lost in the 3D print. Personally, I like to keep the quality as high as possible until the very end. Then I can kind of adjust it and experiment as I see fit. So that's taken me up to three million faces. It's not extremely high, but it's kept all the detail quite nicely. And now I can come in and you can see that that is joined together without any overlap. I will need to smooth areas out a bit and just re-sculpt a little bit in these areas. If you're doing a remesh to a high value like this, it helps to have a powerful computer. Which brings me to today's sponsor, NVIDIA and PC Specialist. As I'm sure you're aware, Blender's performance is greatly increased by NVIDIA RTX cards. This is me in the viewport, in cycles, with a very high resolution mesh getting almost instant feedback. PC Specialist are an NVIDIA Studio partner and leading system builders, selling a range of customizable PCs that perform amazingly with Blender. They specialize in custom PCs and laptops for creators and gamers. So configure your next NVIDIA RTX system using PC Specialist Online Configurator today. So the next part was making the cape. And these kind of fasteners are quite straightforward. They're just a cylinder, bevel and subdivision surface modifier. So when it comes to the actual cloth part of the cape, I use a technique which I commonly use for clothing. I start off with a plane, so shift A to add mesh plane, and I'll scale it down into position, and I roughly line it up with my mesh like this. Then I add a shrink wrap modifier, so add modifier, shrink wrap modifier. The target is the male remesh, and you can see that snapping there. Generally these settings are absolutely fine. You probably want it above surface though, and have a slight offset, so it actually sticks above the surface like this. It just makes it a bit easier to model. I'll turn this down to 0 0.005 though, so it's fairly close. Now I need to turn snapping on. So that's snapping up here. Make sure it's snapped to faces and that align rotation to target is enabled and project individual elements as well. That means when I go into edit mode and start moving these points, so G to grab, move that into position and one around here as well. All these points start snapping to my base mesh. Combined with the shrink wrap means it's pushed slightly above the surface and I can start modeling the top part of the cape. It's also helpful if you turn the on cage button and then you can actually see the modifier and it makes it a little bit easier. So I create the mesh all the way around, put it into position. I'm just creating the top part because obviously the back part doesn't want to attach to the body. So I'll apply the shrink wrap. I create a fairly straight line at the back here and into object mode and apply the shrink wrap modifier. I can turn snapping off now, back into edit mode and select the edges from here to here and extrude those outwards and start creating a cape. I can then add a solidify modifier to give it a bit of thickness. Before I do that, 
into object mode and control A to apply the scale, then I know these measurements are going to be accurate. And this helps as well because it's now overlapping my shape. I can change this with the offset, so bring it up slightly away from the middle. I can also add a multi-resolution modifier on top of this and subdivide it a few times and start sculpting on the shape. I can keep my solidify as well and then apply them all at the end when I'm happy with the shape. Now the thickness was the tricky bit because that's where you're going to get a failure with the 3D print if you're not careful. And I did fail with my first print and it was pretty much down to the fact that the cape wasn't thick enough. So in the end I did make it quite thick, but even with the extra thickness, the end result was quite nice, so that's all okay. The base is fairly simplistic. It's just a blob that I sculpted using some of the rock textures that I've downloaded several times before. I think having a rock that he's standing on is a little bit better than just standing straight onto the base. I did a little bit of extra sculpting with the draw sharp brush to give it some real crevices on the rocks and I made sure that it overlapped with the shoes so that there weren't any tiny gaps where I'd need extra support. So all the time I'm trying to minimize any overhang so we don't need to put those supports in. Now I'm just connecting all my shapes together with the boolean and again trying to minimize any overhang. Now that everything is one complete model I go in and just tidy a few things up especially on the arm that had pinching earlier making sure that's got some creases in there and just tidying it up in general. I hadn't actually joined the cape at this point but I do in a moment. I thought I'd show you a tiny bit of me texture painting with the vertex paint tools just for those that might be interested. I much prefer texturing with the normal texture painting tools rather than vertex paint. I found the vertex paint didn't give me many options when it came to layers or it may just be that I didn't understand it completely because I rarely use it but I couldn't seem to get any extra layers working. So here's the final model before sending it to my 3D slicer program. You can see the thickness of the cape is quite considerable now, but again, it doesn't come out too badly when printed. You can also see that I've joined the mesh together. If I come inside the mesh here, you can see that. It's a little bit iffy on the inside there, but you can't really see any problems with the 3D print, so that's fine. This is also with the decimate modifier applied, so it's got 300,000 triangles. And if I go into edit mode, you can kind of see what that modifier does. So that's add modifier, decimate, and you can bring down the ratio here and it tells you the face count you're going to end up with. And I did look on a few forums to see what people were saying about the amount of faces for 3D printing and 300,000 faces seem to be the maximum that people suggested going to. And in terms of quality, you can see there's a lot of quality certainly around the belt there and the decimation modifier kind of makes a bit of a mess of it. But again, it comes out fine on the 3D print. And you've got this sort of detail in the face. All the features you can still make out. You can see some of these creases here and they do come out with the 3D print, just about. So that's the sort of level of detail we're looking at. Before sending it to my slicer program, I use the 3D print toolbox. You go to edit preferences, into add-ons and type in 3D-print or you can type in toolbox. And there it is, just make sure that's ticked and you come out with this. You can check things like the overhangs. I had my print set up to put in supports at 60 degrees. And if I check that now, it takes a few moments, but it will give me some idea of what's going on with my mesh. And you can see there's kind of a few errors here, non-manifold edge and things like that. I did press the make manifold button as well. And that seemed to delete a fair few vertices and modified a few vertices as well, as you can see down the bottom here. And I must admit, I don't fully understand what that tool does. <laughs> A manifold mesh has no holes in it, but I'm not sure how the tool goes about fixing those holes with the description it gave, but it looked like a good button to press. If I scroll down a bit, you've got export options here as well, and there's an apply scale. That's quite useful because often there's a difference between the scale in Blender and the scale in your slicer. So if I go to item, you can see that my dimensions mean that this is 15 centimeters tall. And with the 3D print toolbox, if you have that apply scale set, when you export it, it will go into your 3D slicer program at the right scale. The slicer program I was using is called Ultimaker Cura and it's version five. And these are the settings that I used for my printer. The printer I used was from Kaiwu 3D. I was lucky enough to be sent this by them and I was really impressed. It had a self-leveling bed, heated bed. So all the kind of things you want as a more beginner type person. It was a bit more expensive than other ones that I've reviewed, such as the Ender 3 Max but it did end up with a much better print. From the perspective of someone that doesn't really want to spend loads of time on settings and adjusting things and so forth, I would say this is the perfect printer for someone like me who's an artist that just wants to print their models. 
I still need to do a bit of experimenting to stop the stringiness in the printer and try and get my supports so they're not as difficult to take off. And also I would suggest not having models with a cape if you're going to 3D print them. You should be trying to avoid overhang as much as possible. So there we have it, my 3D print of Saitama and the end render. Hopefully you enjoyed the process. Do comment below with any questions or thoughts you might have. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.